Thanks, Senators Wagner and Bennett for introducing the bill, and Senators Fetterman, Warren, Brown, Reed, and Booker, and Sanders for co-sponsoring, and also thanks to Representative Beyer in the House for introducing. Thanks to all of you for joining us to learn more about this critical bill. And if you are as excited uh, as we are about helping make powerful legislation like the UI Modernist Recession and Readiness Act a reality, then consider joining our team at NELP. We are hiring now for an unemployment insurance program director to help lead this work. And I will drop the link in the chat. Back over to you, Sam. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that context and for, and for setting the stage. Um, I will take a moment now to introduce um, the panelists for the rest of today's conversation. Um, we have a great group of folks here um, to share their expertise with you. Um, we have Michelle Evermore, who is the Interim Director of Disability Economic Justice and a Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation. And Michelle was formerly the Deputy Director for Policy in the Office of Unemployment Insurance Modernization, so has amazing perspective on this from government as well. Um, Alex Hurdle Fernandez is an Associate Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, also coming to us recently from service uh, in the government, was formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Evaluation at the Department of Labor and a Senior Fellow at the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Gabby Bolden Shaw is the Jefferson Parish Organizer at Step Up Louisiana. Um, thanks for joining us today, Gabby. Really looking forward to hearing about your experiences. Um, Shelby Mayenberg is a work source specialist from Tumwater, Washington, and a member of Ask Me Council 28 and WFSC Local 443, where he serves as vice president. Um, and lastly, we'll have a, a video statement um, sent in by Ms. Migalina Dalton, who is a licensed clinical social worker from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and unfortunately could not join us live for today's briefing, but we're lucky to have a recording of her story to share with all of you. Um, before I begin turning questions over to the panel um, and sharing their insights, I did want to flag, um, we will have Q&A uh, after the panel discussion. So please feel free to open the Q&A function um, that you see at the bottom of the Zoom screen and drop in questions as we go. And we will do our best to um, pass them to the appropriate person on the panel. So feel free to drop those in as people are speaking. And again, we'll return back to them at the end. Okay, so to kick it off, um, Michelle, I will turn to you first. Um, you have both government and outside advocacy kind of nonprofit world experiences with what is going on in states across the country with the unemployment insurance system. Um, what trends are you seeing overall with UI? Yeah, so maybe I'll take a step back. And so from, the, from its founding, the idea of unemployment insurance was supposed to be that states collect money from employers and sometimes employees when times are good so that we can pay workers who lose work when times are bad. Uh, however, this good idea has created a pernicious pattern. Everyone is in favor of getting benefits out the door during an economic downturn to keep pain in one part of the economy from uh, taking down the rest of the economy. Um, and so states spend their savings, their UI trust funds rightly, to get benefits to workers. But once the crisis passes, states will have depleted their trust funds, and usually employer taxes go up, uh, depending on the health of the UI trust fund. So employer taxes go up, usually in January at the start of a legislative session, just as workers have gone back to work and are no longer paying that much attention to unemployment insurance. This creates a perfect storm for employers to lobby to cut benefits. Uh, George Wentworth uh, published a terrific publication for NELP in 2016 called Closing the Doors on the Unemployed that describes exactly what states did at the end of the Great Recession. Uh, to summarize, states cut access to benefits by cutting the number of weeks, making it harder to qualify, reducing benefit amounts, and added onerous new requirements to make it more difficult to continue to get benefits on a weekly basis. When the pandemic hit, thank goodness we had friends in Congress who uh, knew what had happened. Uh, they immediately added three programs to address these three shortcomings. Pandemic unemployment assistance increased the number of people who could qualify, pandemic unemployment emergency compensation, added weeks of benefits, and federal pandemic unemployment compensation added $600 in the beginning and later $300 per week to benefits. About half of everyone who got a benefit in the pandemic got it through this side program, PUA. Think about that. If this recession had not been a pandemic, only half of the people who got paid would have been eligible. That's why we need uh, minimum the minimum eligibility requirements in this bill. But standing up huge new programs 
quickly created other problems. Benefits did not go out quickly, causing frustration. States had questions about how to administer the program that got resolved over time, but resulted in improper payments early on. Fraudsters saw this big program and came up with sophisticated attacks. And that's why now more than ever, we need minimum standards and a way to automatically increase benefits that states can set up well in advance of a crisis. We need to fix the roof while the sun is shining. And then finally, uh, people don't just lose their jobs in a recession. Um, so sometimes um, bosses are mean to people for little reason and and, and lay people off. Uh, plants lay, out, lay off people all the time. So as Rebecca said, uh, people need a UI system that works for them whenever they need it, not just in emergencies. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, and I guess building off of that point about fixing the roof while the sun is shining and ideally not while it's hailing or raining. Um, Alex, I want to turn to you where um, the U.S. is still on the bounce back from a devastating recession triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know there will be, you know, as Michelle alluded to, more, more downturns in the future. Can you remind us why a strong UI system is particularly important during those times of economic downturn and crisis? And how would the Unemployment Insurance Modernization and Recession Readiness Act uh, help us prepare and for and combat future recessions? Yeah, thanks for that question, Sam. And so to step back, as Michelle did, the legislation that created the unemployment insurance system during the New Deal had these two purposes. One was to provide assistance to unemployed workers and their families. And the other goal was to stabilize the overall economy during downturns by putting money back into the economy and helping stabilize demand. And we've seen recession after recession that the unemployment insurance system does this and does this quite well. You know, for instance, in the last recession during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Census Bureau estimated that UI benefits kept nearly 5 million people, including over a million children, out of poverty in 2020. And we also know that um, in addition to keeping folks out of poverty, it helped to reduce many forms of material and mental insecurity that individuals face. And all of those checks that are going out to people help stabilize the economy. You know, Macroeconomic and analysts all agree that the economy would have been worse, that unemployment would have been higher, that output would have been lower during the pandemic had we not had all of those forms of expanded benefits that Michelle laid out. Um, but the critical piece of this, as, as Michelle pointed out, is we depend on ad hoc actions by Congress to expand benefits during downturns when we know that benefits need to be longer to reach more people. And what we really need is a better system of automatic benefits that trigger on during downturns so that people can get the help that they need right when they need it. Now, we have a system in place of automatic triggers that is supposed to do that in the unemployment insurance system called extended benefits. They're supposed to turn on automatically in states that experience high levels of unemployment when it meets certain criteria. But the remarkable thing is since their creation um, over several decades, these automatic triggers and extended benefits have actually not been effective at turning on. And we have to rely far more frequently on Congress to make these ad hoc extensions. So if we go to the next slide, um, I've um, shown data from 1986 to 2021 looking at where UI benefits come from. And we can see here that um, over 80% of regular uh, of benefits come from the regular UI system. Um, and then the rest um, uh, come from either ad hoc extensions or these extended triggers that are supposed to trigger on during recessions. But most of those um, uh, other benefits outside of the regular benefits, those are coming from those ad hoc actions that Congress takes, which are vital, but we should have more automatic triggers uh, in in place. So why is it that these triggers don't work and they aren't turning on in the ways that they're supposed to? Well, one reason is that many states don't use a measure of unemployment, but rather use a measure of receipt of unemployment insurance. And so that means that their trigger isn't just affected by whether or not there's a downturn in their state, but also by the eligibility standards that they might have. And stingier states are less likely to trigger on, not because their economy is, taking, um, uh, is doing better, but because fewer people are receiving benefits. In addition, many of these measures are state specific. They're not tailored to downturns that might be happening in a region or across the country. And so one state might look like they're doing better, um, even as the economy as a whole is going into recession. And it's important that we would trigger on in that state to prevent the pain from spreading. And last, um, another significant flaw in these triggers is that they turn off if unemployment isn't increasing in many cases. And so that means during periods of high unemployment that's stagnant and um, at that high level, that benefits may trigger off. And so if we go to the, the next slide, I've shown you 
two of the triggers that are used in this system and the number of states that have turned on under those triggers over the past recessions that we've seen in the 90s and 2000s um, and thereafter in those gray bars. And I want you to take away two things from this chart. The first is during these recessions that happened in the early 1990s, the early 2000s, the Great Recession, many states aren't triggering on under these rules because the triggers are so flawed. And second, what I want you to see as well is that even as the economy as a whole is still in recession, many states are triggering off. That is, during those gray periods of recession, you're seeing the number of states that have these triggers in place declining. So for all of these reasons, we need to reform the, the extended benefit system, and that's exactly what this proposed legislation does. It moves states away from relying just on measures of UI recipiency to requiring um, a, a more expansive definition of the health of the economy in a particular state, considers both the state and national unemployment rate, and it doesn't turn off if unemployment is high but not increasing. Um, and, and so for all of these reasons, this bill would do a lot to help improve that automatic system of benefits um, to address recessions. Thanks for that, Alex. That disparity in the chart is really shocking, I think. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Gabby, I want to turn to you. Speaking of, of the states, you work um, directly with, with workers in Louisiana on the ground. Um, and can you just share why unemployment insurance is still important to them, even now in 2024, especially when everyone's general picture of how the national economy is doing is generally that unemployment is low, things are going well. Why is it still important to workers in Louisiana? Well, it's still important here because our benefits are very low. And had it not been for P PUA, we would not have survived here. Um, benefits need to be expanded across a wider project, right? So my organization, Step Up Louisiana, fought to get the unemployment benefits raised by $28. Our benefits here were $244, now they're at $272. But that's still very low with rent rising, food rising, everyday necessities rising, and an average apartment here is $1,000 a month. And that's on the low end, right? And so these benefits need to be raised so that we can survive. You know, we need to have time to find jobs that we are compatible to versus the job that we're taking just to take. That means the turnover rate is going to be high. That means people are going to move from here to other states just so they can survive. And so this is a very big issue here. And that's a very good reason why these standards need to be addressed. Thanks for that, Gabby. Um, and to turn to a state on the other side of the country, but that still has its own its own unique problems with UI. Um, Shelby, um, I wanna ask you as a unemployment insurance and employment services program worker yourself, what are, what are the aspects of the bill that you're most excited about? I think one of the biggest things that I'm most excited about is providing more funding to folks so that they can better sustain themselves. Um, in my work, one of the things that we have to look at is what barriers are preventing someone from finding work. And the most common barrier is there's not enough money coming in. Um, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I have, I have my own story with this. Um, during the pandemic, I actually transferred to our unemployment claim center. Uh, and in March of 2022, I was laid off due to federal funding running out. Um, of course, very next day, applied for unemployment. Um, and so I went from receiving about 1500 after taxes per paycheck to getting 480 after taxes each week. Uh, so looking at it at a percentage, um, that's a 35, almost 36% loss in wages. Um, for rent, I am on the very low end in my area at 600 a month. Uh, and my car payment is $416. With two weeks of unemployment benefits, um, I could not afford both rent and my car payment. Um, so I went from being able to cover that and then some to having not enough at all. And that would not even alone cover things like groceries and other things that are deemed non-essentials. Um, another one of the pieces that's extremely important is that, that waiting week. Um, 
it's shocking enough just losing your position, even if you know it's coming. Um, you still can't apply for benefits ahead of time. So that waiting week is really key for a lot of folks. You go from uh, making a very specific amount of money to then making less than what you're accustomed to. And you have to plan for that. It's extremely difficult in today's, today's economy to plan for something like that. Uh, the, the cost of gasoline and groceries alone is just astronomical and it makes it very difficult to plan for things like that. Absolutely. And I think also um, the, just the rule, any rules that make that process more restrictive are just adding more, adding more pain points for workers when they can least bear them. Um, Michelle, I want to turn to you kind of considering both Gabby's experiences in Louisiana and Shelby's in Washington, why are national standards for UI on eligibility, duration, and benefits so important? Thanks. Um, yeah, so people think of UI as a program to provide macroeconomic stabili stabilization during recessions, but it's also a program to make sure people can have enough support to find a good replacement for their lost job so that losing work doesn't drive down someone's wage potential. Um, for that, you need to be eligible for a benefit that pays enough for a long enough time to get you a good replacement to your old job. Um, earlier, I was talking about how states engage in a race to the bottom after recessions. What's really important to understand about that is that race to the bottom tends to be, be the most intense with states with the most diverse populations. So cutting benefits in states with the highest BIPOC uh, populations further perpetuates systemic racism. Uh, take Michigan, for example. They were the first state in recent years to cut the number of weeks of benefits available. They went from 26 to 20 weeks. At that time, the average duration for a period of unemployment for a black worker in Michigan was 27 weeks. For a white worker, it was 19. Um, this is a very specific harm. Uh, the reason, incidentally, that states cut weeks was that it was it was a condition of getting congressionally approved emergency programs. States were prohibited from reducing benefit benefit amounts. That's why it's so important that the authors of the bill thought of all the ways that states can cut benefits all at once. Um, Anti-worker policymakers don't necessarily care where they cut. They just want UI to be cheaper. So if you mandate a certain amount of duration, um, but not a benefit, uh, you know, not a replacement level, well, that's what, where they'll cut. If you if you mandate a certain number of weeks um, without having floors, you know, they'll, they'll just cut in a different place. Um, the other thing I want to highlight about having floors um, means similarity. Um, I spent a long time at the Department of Labor trying to figure out how to build technical solutions that could be in implemented across multiple states. Seems like it should be possible. Uh, the problem is that if every state has completely different eligibility requirements, that also means they ask totally different questions and have completely different formulas for paying out benefits. That means a state needs their completely own uh, technology setup. That means that when one state figures out a great solution to make the process easier, or one state develops an effective fraud prevention strategy, that can't be cut and pasted to other states. Uh, the more variable the access across state systems, the more difficult and expensive it is to administer the program. Uh, taking that back to a practical example, if states had a standard income replacement of, say, 75% during the pandemic, it could have been technically feasible to increase that 75% to 100% and not had to deal with all the controversy around the flat $600. Um, the bottom line is the race to the bottom is going to keep going until UI is meaningless. The Missouri House uh, passed a bill two years ago that would have cut duration down to just eight weeks. And there's nothing the DOL could do to stop them. Um, it's critical that people have enough benefits for enough time to find a good replacement job. Thanks for that, Michelle. And I guess to that point, Shelby, I want to turn back to you for a question about just taking cuts, how policymakers, you know, in the absence of a national framework and some standards on it, will just take those cuts wherever they're available. You know, sometimes they will describe those cuts as a way to save money, and other times they will describe it as a way to encourage people to get back to work faster, to address like a perceived real or not labor shortage or, or some other issue, and that overly gen generous unemployment insurance benefits will make people lazy, discourage them from looking for work if they can collect UI benefits that are higher than an available, the wages for an available job, you know, in their, in their community. Um, in your experience, is this true? 
No. Uh, in fact, finding a jo good job is extremely difficult right now. Let's run through scenario real quick. So you're in IT and you found this awesome job at, uh, at a Microsoft. It's the exact field you just got out of. It's something that you can just walk right into and, and do the work. Um, now let's see, Microsoft is one of the biggest employers uh, in tech and they're gonna receive probably thousands of applications for a position because they are one of the top employers in that field. Uh, this means that they're most likely using what's called applicant tracking systems to have a computer system scan a resume in an application packet in order to filter folks in and out so that way they don't take as much time to review every single application. Now, in order to be most successful in beating these applicant tracking systems, you need to do research on the position. You need to read the application packet. You need to answer every single question. You have to tailor your resume to meet all of the qualifications and then some. Uh, same with the cover letter. So we're going from what used to take, you know, maybe an hour at most to apply for a position. Um, you're probably going to take at least three hours to apply for a job that's that's well paying. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do coming back to work for my state here in Washington was one, try and get employed back in employment security department, but I would have taken a job anywhere at the state. Um, this meant going you know, every single day, checking out what's available, and then tailoring every single resume and every single answer to every single question to what the employer wanted to see. It took me about four months to come back to the position I was in before. It wasn't even a change within the position. It was the exact same one that I had left. Um, so if we're going to tell people that, you know, that there's a labor shortage or, or anything like that. It's not true. There's a lot of work out there and a lot of people that can do that work, but it's having to maneuver within the systems that are currently in place in order to be as successful as possible. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. I think something that we often talk about in, in the UI advocacy space is just generally that the strongest incentive to work is needing to have money from working and cutting benefits further and adding these other restrictions is really just causing people kind of more pain. Um, Alex, I, I think on, on a similar topic, turning to you, could you speak about how the job seekers allowance that is proposed in this bill would help the UI system be more responsive to some of the realities that, that Shelby was talking about? Yeah, you know, it's one of the provisions that I'm most excited about in this legislation. It's a really innovative idea that supports important segments of the workforce, and in some cases, growing segments of the workforce that we know are vulnerable um, and need that kind of support when they're looking for a job. So what is a job seekers allowance? As the legislation envisions it, it would provide up to $250 a week, um, potentially less, depending on a worker's circumstance, for workers um, who might not otherwise qualify for unemployment insurance because they're new to the labor market or have taken time out of, of the labor market, or they haven't worked enough to receive a, a large enough benefit through regular unemployment insurance for it to be meaningful to support their, their work search. Um, so who are these people? Um, well, an important group are young workers um, who are entering the labor market for the first time and who are looking for work. We know that young workers, especially when they are entering a labor market that's um, going into a recession or is in a downturn, that that can have impacts on those young workers' careers for, for the rest of their lives. Lives, um, that they're matched with lower quality jobs, that that period out of work or being placed in a, in a job that's less well suited to their skills can have lasting implications. So a job seekers allowance could help those workers find a job that is um, better matched to, to their skills, particularly important during those periods of, of high unemployment or an economic downturn. We know that this could be an incredibly important benefit too for workers who have maybe taken time out of the labor market because they're re-entering after a period of incarceration or contact with the criminal justice system. It's a particular vulnerable population that we know needs support when they're looking for jobs. Um, and this is exactly the kind of support that um, could better match them with, uh, with jobs suited to their skills and experience.
experiences and produce those beneficial long-term social and economic outcomes. Uh, we also know that it could be incredibly important for caregivers, caretakers who are taking care of children or elderly family members, other family members who require attention, who've taken time out of work to do that and are then looking to re-enter and, and don't have the work experience that would qualify them for regular UI. So for all of these reasons, I think the Job Seekers Allowance could be an incredibly exciting way. We could support better matching workers with jobs um, who wouldn't otherwise qualify for, for sufficient UI benefits under the regular system. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, and, and Gabby, turning to you, I think on both kind of what legislation like this could mean for workers in your state or even thinking about the job seekers or other provisions, some of the realities even of what the labor market is like, you know, in say a city like New Orleans with a heavy tourism industry and high population of black workers who are facing, you know, more discrimination in the labor market. Um, we know that Louisiana, you know, as you mentioned earlier, pays some of the uh, country's lowest UI benefits and that just 16% of unemployed workers in the state get UI benefits. How would you see legislation like this impacting workers in New Orleans and across the state? Well, I'll see it with impacting workers a lot. Um, again, because we do have some of the lowest benefits across the state, you know, um, this is the tourism industry here, right? And so jobs come and go, conventions are high at certain times of the year, and then they slack off at others, you know? And so this would be a great help. But not only that, the job market, like someone said, you know, uh, Workers aren't are not working be, not because the jobs aren't there. It's because of the critiques that they have to go through to get the jobs, right? And so by this being the hospitality industry, jobs come and go. Again, jobs come and go. But this standard would make it a whole lot easier for folks to find jobs that actually fit their experiences rather than just taking something just to take it. Right. Because we all know that when we take a job that we love to do, we give it everything we got. But when we take something just to make ends meet, the turnover rate is still going to be high, which means it's still going to be an issue. So I think setting the standards across the states gives people a little bit more flexibility to take the time and actually find the work that they're compatible for, but also be able to continue to survive and thrive at the same time. Absolutely. Um, all great points. Um, uh, and I, we, I wanna turn before we go to Q and A to a um, short video from our last panelist who I mentioned who was not able to join us live, unfortunately, um, but was able to share some of her story with us. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Michalina Dalton. Uh, my name is Michalina Dalton. I am a mental health professional. Um, uh, specifically, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I provide mental health services to, um, to individuals in numerous settings. Um, during the beginning of the pandemic, um, I was working as a medical social worker, um, providing um, social work services for um, chronically ill uh, patients. I loved, absolutely loved the work that I did. But when uh, education became virtual, I had to postpone um, my work in order to be able to attend to my family. Uh, my, my children were, were very young at the time and they needed a parent at home. Um, uh, to help them with uh, internet connections that weren't working and the whole slew of complications that arose because of virtual learning. I uh, left that job that I loved um, to uh, work from home, but even that became untenable because of the demands uh, that children impose by the very nature of being children and uh, because of the constraints of online learning. Um, I had no other choice. I had to um, resign and um, 
I found myself unemployed. I uh, was told by a friend about the um, the pandemic unemployment assistance, and I applied, and I was deemed eligible. Uh, and I was, and I started receiving it around May of 2021 until the program expired on Labor Day of 2021. And while I received, while I received that that benefit, it was an, an enormous help for uh, myself, my family, and um, uh, my and my parents that I was also assisting as a member of the sandwich generation. Um, but when it expired, um, I, I should note, uh, I'd like to add that I was very diligent with um, uh, adhering to all of the expectations that were imposed on on workers, you know, reporting all, all of my actions in, in my search for work. Um, and I uh, was very honest and uh, meticulous in my reporting. Um, but it's important to note that um, in my field, all that was available was contract work. It was only up until very, very recently that uh, full-time, part-time employment was actually available. In my line of work, only contract work is available. And um, I think that this was the case for many people, not just in my field. And I think it's important for um, um, all those that uh, are privy to this information that, that they become aware that um, many people are not just using this as a means for advantage. This is a real necessity and, and constraints that are set upon us by um, um, other factors and uh, that it's, it's very important that um, if the Unemployment Insurance Improvement and Recession Readiness Act passes, more people will be able to receive the benefits they so desperately need when they are out of a job. Another point that I'd like to make is that people don't just need UI during times of national crisis. Anytime a worker loses a job, it's a time of personal crisis for them and their families. And for those who cannot only, and for those people who can only find contract work or can't find a job within 26 weeks, no matter how hard they look, as I did, the Job Seekers Allowance will also help them have the resources they need to support themselves and their families and keep looking for the new job. Um, I hope I have been um, of some assistance um, in uh, this endeavor to propel some fruitful benefit um, to the people of this great country. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, thank you to Miguelina for sharing that with us and to the NELP team for putting for sharing it. Um, uh, I want to turn to Q&A with, with our remaining time. Um, we had a few questions come in here in the chat, and I just want to add, if you did not get to send one in, but one has occurred to you, or you want to hear more from any of the panelists in particular, please feel free, open up the little Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom, drop that in so, so we can see it, and we'll do our best to handle it. Um, I'll turn to a couple of the questions that came in during the webinar. Um, so there's one question here about the possibility of, uh, or the current status of adding undocumented immigrant workers to those who would be eligible to receive UI benefits. Um, and I'll turn that over to Judy on the NELP team. Hi folks, for those who don't know me, I'm Judy Conti, NELP's Director of Government Affairs. Um, first, uh, NELP is incredibly supportive of making sure that all workers, including undocumented workers, get UI, and we are working to help support a number of campaigns throughout the country in various states where there is some movement and some possibility of making this reform. I'm sure you all know um, at the federal level, it um, there are incredibly toxic discussions about undocumented workers and, and, and all immigrants, in fact. Um, and it is, it is not only a non-starter for this legislation in that it, it would it would not only kill any hope of eventual bipartisan support, but it would also probably keep a lot of Democrats off the bill who feel like they're in tight districts and or um, or you know states around the borders where they just couldn't get on board with something like that. But it would also then we we fear turn into a toxic discussion in terms of what should be legislation that can be discussed on a, a civilized 
bipartisan fashion. Um, we hate that that's the reality. I, I don't want you to think that this means there's any capitulation to those kind of narratives on NELP's part in the least. Um, but for the time being, it isn't politically advantageous on the federal level to try to include that. But as is always the case, we believe that the states are the places like what we, we call the laboratories of experiment, the best places to show how and how it can work and why it works and why it's important to cover undocumented workers. So in the, the blue states where there are campaigns to do that, we're very actively supporting them. Thanks for that, Judy. Um, I saw another question come in in Q&A about how kind of unemployment insurance as a uh, response to economic recession or crisis uh, compares to something like a pilot job guarantee program. Um, so wondering if I think maybe Michelle first, but anyone else who wants to weigh in, um, if you could speak to how those options compare in terms of, you know, what's what's most helpful to workers and in, in those economic downturns. Yeah, so unemployment insurance has this ridiculously underused feature that very few people know about um, that sort of functions as a job guarantee, which is called a sh short time compensation or work sharing. And what that is, is it's something that the employer can apply for. So say the employer realizes, oh my gosh, the numbers just aren't working out. I need to lay off 20% of my workforce. I don't really want to do that. Um, they have this other option where they can retain everybody and um, just reduce pay, re reduce the number of hours people are working by 20% and then replace that with an unemployment insurance benefit. So instead of laying off 20% of their workforce, they can give everybody a day off and they get unemployment insurance for that day. Um, in in During the pandemic, uh, when the federal uh, pandemic unemployment compensation of either $600 or $300 was in place, that would have attached to the short-time compensation benefit. It did attach, would have, it did. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, the other thing is the Department of Labor clarified in 2022 that work sharing can also apply to bringing workers back that they had initially laid off if they want to bring them back part-time as the, the economy is restarting. Um, uh, Senator Jack Reed has been a champion of work sharing uh, and and uh, has has legislation to improve that prog program and make it easier for employers um, to use. Uh, so, uh, you know, check out the Workforce Retention Act. Um, I don't know if it's been reintroduced yet, this Congress, um, but but it, it it's it's an excellent solution for work sh work sharing. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, one other question that we had come in, um, and, and this is one that actually I think comes up a lot for all of you folks who work, all the panelists here who work more regularly on UI issues. Um, I've heard a lot of concerns over the last couple of years about how susceptible UI is to fraudulent claims. Um, it's been a big issue for a lot of states to track down and deal with, and there's been some very, you know, high profile kind of reporting and, um, and assessments of how that was handled during the pandemic. Um, what does this bill do about, about kind of the issue of fraud, if anyone, if anyone would like to speak to that, or what needs to be done to handle that issue? Well, I can take a crack at it. Um, fraud was before the pandemic, like a, a, a relatively small percent of, um, of, of claims that got paid, um, largely because with unemployment insurance, you have sort of a backstop, right, of uh, I apply for benefits, but then the state agency goes and asks the employer who fired me if I should, should get benefits. That's a pretty good check on whether whether you actually lost your job through no fault of your own and you are who you say you are and you are somebody who recently lost a job. Um, but during the pandemic, um, there, there wasn't that that level of documentation. And so the, you know, these international crime rings used um, information that was stolen from people outside of the unemployment insurance system and used it to apply for benefits. So like through the 2017 Equifax breach. Um, and so, you know, that that continued and and, and states, you know, patched up solutions. Um, you know, Shelby knows all about this because in, in Washington state, they, they were the first to get hit. Um, the, the problem is, um, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't cut and paste Washington state's solution when the next state they hit was Massachusetts. So, you know, Washington state's running on a fast 
um, Enterprises solution. Uh, Washington is running, or uh, uh, Massachusetts is is running on a Deloitte system. They're they're very different. Um, everything works differently in those two states. Um, so you know, it, 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 it's it's a tough problem that um, states have really been working to. Um, put resources toward, uh, you know, there isn't an ultimate solution, better utilization of the NASWA, uh, you know, um, identity hub services would be good. Um, you know, ha having some sort of, you know, automatic fraud detection is important, but, but I think the most important thing about to think about, um, unemployment insurance fraud, these exact same people are hitting the banks. Like this is not a UI problem. This is a whole of government, whole of society problem. And, um, you know, I, I only think, you know, and, and we have relied on this relatively small under-resourced program to fight off the Russian mob and, you know, other, you know, huge criminal enterprises, you know, th that can't be the solution. The solution has to be we all come together and go after the criminal actors in a more, um, more coordinated fashion, I think. Yeah, in addition to underscoring everything that Michelle just shared, I, I would say um, there's the other side of program integrity, too. There are the benefits going out to people who aren't entitled to them, and in particular, the threat of criminal fraud rings that um, uh, took advantage of a particularly susceptible system. But the other side of this are people who are eligible for benefits, but either who don't apply or who apply and because of mistakes in the processing receive delayed benefits or no benefits at all. And I think it's important to keep those folks in the conversation all too often we mainly focus on the first kind of program integrity failure because that's where we collect data. But it's really hard to know who all is out there that might be eligible for UI but isn't receiving it despite the fact that they might benefit from it. You know, the best estimates we have before the pandemic from the Department of Labor are that you know just around 17% of the unemployed um, uh, who are most likely to be eligible for UI were receiving UI. And um, there is still a gap of around 35% um, of people who had applied for UI who were most likely to be eligible who weren't receiving it, and large disparities by race and by education, indicating that more disadvantaged workers were less likely to both apply and then end conditional on apply and receive those benefits. So that suggests to me that we also have that second type of program integrity failure and in the legislation that we're discussing today through the national standards that it would put into place would go a long way in addressing that second type of program integrity failure. That's a really important point too. Thank you for that, for adding that, Alex. Um, I think just, it looks like just one more question here, unless anyone wants to throw another one in the Q&A. Um, and this could be for, for anybody really. Um, we discussed earlier how this is, could be considered a recession readiness bill, but also just thinking of kind of Nicolina's important point about how anytime, even if it's not shared on a nationwide scale, but anytime someone loses uh, employment unexpectedly, it is a personal crisis for that you know, for that individual, for their family, possibly for their community, if it's, you know, multiple folks at the same employer. Um, if this bill is enacted, how would you see ideally a future recession, a future economic crisis, something where a lot of people are feeling that pain at one time? Um, how would it be handled differently than the COVID-19 pandemic, ideally? Let's say if, if we pass the bill while the, while the sun is shining. Uh, Shelby, you want to take this one? So one thing that we've done here in Washington uh, is we there was a bill that was passed that, I forget the exact verbiage of the bill, but it, it allows for a pool of adjudicators to be trained um, to be called upon at any time. So what they can do is they go about their regular job and then should something like this happen again, where uh, there's a sudden increase in people that are seeking benefits, uh, they would just need a quick refresher training and then they can hit the ground running working on cases that during the pandemic completely brought the center to a standstill. Um, so that way we can make sure that folks are receiving the benefits that they're entitled to in a, in a more timely fashion. I'll just add to that, you know, if if we if we just had a reliable working unemployment insurance system that got benefits to the right number of people at the right time, and it was, you know, a sufficient program that covered a sufficient amount of the population, and it had triggers that were already written into the computer systems and already ready to go, that means whenever a recession happens, 
the regular unemployment insurance program simply has to pay more benefits rather than having to set up brand new programs, take a guess at how to administer. I'll, I'll just give you one quick example of things that changed over the pandemic. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people who got pandemic unemployment assistance were asked their pandemic related reason for becoming unemployed. And then some states didn't ask that question every single week after that. And they didn't realize they were supposed to until the fall when they got letters saying, you know, you're really supposed to be asking that every week. So you should go back and ask everybody their COVID related reason every week. Then if, uh, you know, if a person, um, uh, you know, wasn't, if they couldn't track somebody down, that's suddenly an overpayment because um, they're not a answering questions from the agency. And so that, you know, that's the kind of thing we can avoid by just expanding something that we've already defined and already figured out. Thanks for that, Michelle um, and Shelby, great points. Um, uh, we had a question come in about whether other kind of modern industrialized economies experience similar issues with unemployment insurance or their UI-like systems, or is this kind of a uniquely US U.S. federal and state problem. Uh, Alex, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, could spend a long time talking about these differences, but maybe I'd call out three that I think are really relevant for this discussion. And maybe the most important one is um, it's hard to think of another rich democracy that decentralizes as much control over the system, both thinking about benefit amounts and financing of the system as the U.S. does. And as Michelle laid out, that creates these very perverse incentives for the states to race to the bottom on financing, putting downward pressure on their benefits. So that by itself, I think, really sets us apart. And throughout history in the U.S., there are actually many attempts over the years to nationalize um, the uh, the program or at least set these standards that would prevent that race to the bottom. And I think this would take a really important step forward in putting us on the same playing field as other countries when it comes to the UI system. The second difference is in other countries, labor unions are much more closely um, tied to the UI system and are much more um, a, a part of the system of, of administration and um, training workers um, who lose their jobs or helping them match with jobs or even administering UI funds. Um, and that's something some states are experimenting with, but I think would be interesting to see more of. Maybe the last thing to say is, um, and this um, is a bit of a wonky subject, but um, one that I think is worth underscoring that sets us apart from other countries. In the US, most states tie the tax rate that employers pay to how many workers um, that they lay off end up claiming benefits. And again, that introduces some perverse incentives for employers to uh, fiercely contest claims, sometimes in ways that might prevent people who would otherwise be eligible for receiving those benefits. And that's something that's really distinctly um, American as opposed to what other countries do in terms of financing. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, and I see uh, one other in here that um, I think would be great for anyone to weigh in on, whether it's Alex and Michelle from a kind of bigger picture perspective or Gabby and Shelby from your experiences on the ground. Um, what can we do as advocates and individuals to make Congress more receptive to actually doing something positive about unemployment? So. How do you shift the conversation to a place where both workers and our policymakers, you know, our elected leaders view this program as a valuable part of our national infrastructure? And I think maybe we would, all of us would agree that it's kind of, it's underrated and underappreciated uh, until it's really needed, <laughs> the conversation about UI. So whoever might like to take that first, please jump in. I'm going to jump in there real quick. I think um, workers need to share their stories. You know, the people most affected by this system is the ones that need to be up front speaking, right? Because it's, everybody's experience is not the same. And not only that, but this is affecting me, how it affects me, how it affects my family, how it affects my daily life. What what more per, what better person to share that information than someone who's affected by it? And I'll just say that I've been doing for separate research a project on who contacts Congress and on what issues. And um, unsurprisingly, the first thing I looked for was unemployment insurance. And it turns out that Congress tends to hear about unemployment insur insurance during recessions, but very rarely from people, especially, you know, um, Gabby, to your point, from the workers who would benefit from it um, outside of recessions. And that means that it's hard for Congress to take action without that kind of pressure. So I think the more that workers, to Gabby's point, can share their stories directly with Congress and other policymakers and journalists the more we can move the needle on this. Very, very well said. Um, and I think 
I swear that I did not plant that question, but an excellent way for me to, to make a closing call to action for everybody on this call, which is um, if you are interested in engaging on this bill um, in the House or Senate, if you are interested in learning more about these issues or speaking up more for real fixes to the unemployment insurance system, um, one thing that I think we'd all want to encourage you to do today is to urge your member of Congress to co-sponsor this bill. Um, the Unemployment Insurance Modernization and Recession Readiness Act of 2023. Um, it's a long title, but I promise it's worth it. Um, and uh, that uh, we'll share around some of this information in the follow-up, but in the Senate, that's S 3140, and in the House, it's HR 6071, I believe. Um, if you are an advocate working on this issue, and or you want to get involved in this issue and you want to be connected to other groups at the federal, state, and local level who are working on UI um, and all aspects of it, please consider joining NELP's um, NELP Connect UI Advocates community. So it's a mailing list and message board system that's, um, that's open to folks who are working on this issue and want to connect with others. Lots of really helpful resources, technical assistance, research, questions, ideas going around um, going around there. And so there's a link to it in the chat. You can go to connect.nelp.org and click on the join the community button um, and find the UI Connect uh, community there to stay in touch with folks. Um, thank you again for spending your afternoon with us. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful day.